Hey, what's good, y'all? Jay Boogie in full effect mode. Bun down is the sound. You know how we do. This is, of course, The Lounge Presents, and we're live streaming on Twitch. The episode will be available on all streaming platforms, obviously. And today in the lounge space, we are actually welcoming back someone who who we we I I, th I think it's safe to say that we've become homies sure. since since the first time we ever like had a conversation. Definitely. So without any further ado. Hailing from Tennessee by way of Brooklyn, the one, the only, the master of the universe himself, Jake Palumbo. It's quite an intro. Um, thank you, man. <laughs> it's, it's good to be back. Yes, no, for real, man. It's it's been a minute. Um, we've we've had you know some interactions previously. For sure. Through through the wrestling pod. And obviously, uh, we were talking about it a little bit before we went live. We had you and L on when you guys dropped Solving Cases. Definitely. But regardless, you know it's always an open door for you, man. Appreciate it. Much appreciated, man. Like I said, it's good to be back. Hell yes. Hell yes. So so let me ask you this. While the, uh, the clapping tapers off. When we last had you on, what we'll do is we'll 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 get a little bit into into the the backstory, right? Just to update, because for one thing, the 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 other the previous episodes are no longer available for for archiving. So just to refresh folks on who Jake Palumbo is, all right? Yeah. So. We always ask our, our guests that step into the lounge space how they were first introduced to hip hop culture. For me, like I had an obsessive, I have an obsessive personality, period. Uh, <laughs> whenever I become interested in something, I have to learn every micro detail of it. But yeah, I was obsessive over music from the time I was a small child. And I always make this distinction like I didn't have cable growing up. But right. my grandmother did. So when I would go to stay with my grandmother, I would always make her put the TV on MTV. Now, right, right. I didn't care what was on MTV. I just wanted to see music. And so inevitably, right. that starts turning into Yo! MTV raps. So that kind of piques a curiosity, which later turns into I would mow my grandmother's lawn. And every week, I would take that little $20 and go to the music store and buy it. Hey. And so... One day, just out of curiosity more than anything, uh, I bought Public Enemy, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back. There you go. Literally played that tape until the cassette snapped. Oh, my right? To this day. Um, right. And so, you know, by this time, but I, I'm a little younger. So, like, this is already 1994, 95 when this is happening. That album's been out for a while. And so then for my birthday in 1997, I asked my parents to get me Wu-Tang forever for you know, that year. And they did. And that sparked, you know, just I already knew I wanted to be in the music business and, and be a musician. But like that sparked me having to be in hip hop. And from there, uh, you know, 20 years later, uh, you know, a bunch of steps later, that turned into a career. But. You know, I was doing my thing locally in Tennessee, you know, just trying to get noticed there. But that was still a couple of years before the dawn of social media and a lot of the Internet tools. Yeah. So I always say trying to do underground hip hop in East Tennessee at that time was an easy way to starve to death. So, you know, <laughs> years ago, I moved to Brooklyn, uh, you know, and I've been here ever since. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, that was the genesis. So when you were growing up, what were you hearing around the home? What type of music was being played in the home when you were growing up? It was very eclectic. Uh, my father was into a lot of prog rock. He was into okay. Pink Floyd and Yes and King Crimson and Rush and like that kind of stuff. My mother some days would be playing Cat Stevens. Some days she'd be playing Black Sabbath. Okay. Um, you know, and my mother was very uh so I mean they were always they were always supportive of my musical aspirations, period. But even when that began to transition into hip hop, 
even though they didn't completely understand it at first, they made an effort to learn about it and to understand right. it, to understand why, you know, till by the end, by the end of her life, like my mom loved being a hip hop mom. Like she thought hey. you know, she loved meeting rappers and producers and she just thought the whole thing was awesome. So but no, I, I had a supportive household in that aspect. Okay. Let me, Rewind a little bit for Black Sabbath. Which era of Black Sabbath are we talking about? Ozzy era, you know, the, the okay. earlier stuff. She liked Paranoid and, you know, Ooh, yeah. Things. Um, so, yeah, more of the early stuff. Okay, cool, cool. Yo, Paranoid's live, though. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. Jeez. God damn. So, we're, we're looking at this nation of, of millions to hold this back, the public enemy record. That That's a pretty significant record to introduce. You know, as an introduction to hip hop, uh, the the album in of itself is canon now. Obviously, salute to Chuck D, Flavor Flav, Terminator X, Professor Griff, the S1Ws, Bomb Squad. Goddamn! Yep. What was it about that record that drew you in? You know what it was at the time. You know, and I'm 13 ish at the time. Like I was already beginning to listen to punk rock. And I was really into a lot of stuff that had an anti-establishment message or a revolutionary message. And the first time I took home that public enemy tape, I don't know what it was, but it just felt like they they were doing the same thing that punk bands like Minor Threat and stuff like that yeah. were doing. But it, oh, just, yeah. it felt so much more effective. Yes. Like, I remember as a kid thinking, like, if I were going to have somebody on the battlefield for me, this is who it would be. Yeah, and, you know, even on down to like, bro, I, I went to school in Tennessee in the 90s. Like, I I was not taught who Huey P. Newton was in school, like, or Bobby Seal or, you know, Farrakhan yeah. or any of this yeah. stuff. I literally <laughs> learned. You in school? <laughs> I literally, no, I mean, for real, like, they barely even taught American history. But yeah, I know. saying that to say that, like, I learned so much just from listening to those records. Yeah. The you know, I mean, I don't know. It just it felt like for some reason, just it felt like the it was so much more effective. The message was just getting across with a louder sonic boom. Yeah. And it really opened my eyes up to, you know, what hip hop is capable of. So that's why I fell in love with it. I feel like the bomb squad sound was, was kind of like um the wall of sound created by, you know, that crazy dude mm -hmm. with the hair. You know what I mean? Those but like factors, hip hop yeah. version. Right? Right. Oh, he said the name. Look at that. He said the name. <laughs> I was trying to avoid saying the uh -oh. name, but you know. Uh -oh. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it really did. I mean, the layering of samples and things yeah. of that nature. And I remember when mm. I first started putting two and two together that this is where they got this from and, and stuff like that. Like it was hugely influential. Well, one of one of the, I mean, th there were a lot of, of reasons to have that record in regular rotation but one of the, one of the reasons was most definitely trying to decipher all the samples because sure. it's so dense so dense right no definitely and you know from from the bomb squad i start studying the rizza and i start studying yeah. Pete rock and everybody else from there and you know yeah. and not just that but studying the people that they sampled and you yeah. know where this source material comes from definitely yeah so 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 let me ask you this. I mean, a lot of people, when they're exposed to the culture, they fall in love with it. You know, they, they, they go to jams, they, they buy all the records, you know what I mean? But not, not necessarily are built or, you know, have any intention to actually wade into the water of the music industry. What, what propelled you to do that? I'm not cut out for anything else. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I, I think in all seriousness, I am built a certain way um, that I've never had a problem with hard work. I've never had a problem with breaking a sweat. I, I have had a huge problem with wasting my years as a human, like a breathing organism. Yeah. You know, doing things that I don't like doing. So I always wanted to kind of design a world where, you know, I, I basically only had to answer to myself. Yeah, you know, I still have to answer to the bank and the IRS. And I mean, yeah. Things <laughs> the of usual. That nature, but yeah. 
it, it was one of those things that I just know that like you're spent, you spend a minimum of one third of your life working. Yeah. So it was very important to me because I had a lot of jobs. Like I worked at Sears, I worked at the supermarket, like I worked at, you know, I unloaded trucks, I worked in a warehouse, I I was a telemarketer for eight hours. Um, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I, I did a bunch of different jobs just trying to pay the bills. And, you know, it it, it just kind of left me feeling like I was spinning my tires. Like I could do bad for myself kind of theory because I yeah, wasn't yeah. getting rich working for anybody else. So I'm like, yeah. if I'm going to be poor to begin with, why not just make an earnest attempt at doing, you know, something for myself? So... From the get go, even when I was in Tennessee, like I was pressing up my own CDs and trying to perform locally and tour and, and do all that. But you just hit a wall after a certain point. And again, I was very I was young at this time. And this is 2003, 2004. Like we're still not quite at the dawn of my space. So I moved to New York. You know, just I, I'm one of those people that I, I benefit well from being thrown into the deep end of the pool and having mm. to not drown. The adversity. Um, you know, I, I'm baptism by fire, they call it in the South. There you go. But, yep. uh, so I moved to New York in 2006 with about 75 bucks to my name and got a job and found an apartment and, you know, started putting it together. I was still making Jake Palumbo music at that point and, you know, still doing the do. But it was around that time that I kind of picked up my day job, for lack of a better term. And that's when I became right. an engineer started working at different studios then those studios start going out of business and in 2011 i just got my own studio space and you know filtered all the clientele into there and from there over the next decade basically was where i built what i have today uh you know i would base lab you know i i parlayed a lot of relationships you know of people who came into the studio to get their stuff recorded and mixed for sure. You know, when they have a great session with you, it's a much easier sell to be like, hey, can I play you some beats? Or, yeah. you know, hey, like, you know, this is what I'm doing. What would you know, have to do to get a song together? You know, yeah. so on and so forth. So my main thing is just powered by passion. Like, I know what it feels like to wake up and hate your reality. And I know what it feels like to wake up and enjoy your reality. Mm -hmm. And... Now, let's be clear, like I've been self-employed for, you know, over 15 years now. And God it, damn. Hell yes. Thank you. Uh, but it comes with sets of headaches that, you know, I sure. never had to experience when I was working a nine to five. Like, yep. you know, I, I always laugh and joke of like, yeah, I've, you know, this is going well and it has been going well for many years, but a few bad missteps and this could all crumble. Yeah. So I'm just saying that to say that knowing that there was a risk, I'm sorry I took the long way around answering your question, but uh, <laughs> the just knowing that I ran the risk of working for somebody else and still being poor and unfulfilled, I felt like it was worth the risk to, you know, I can at least fail on my own. And, you know, what's yeah. the worst that can happen? I go back to school, I get a job, you know, yeah. life goes on. Uh, but you know, I've basically, I always say the people who win the race in the music industry are not who gets to the finish line first. It's who can remain in the race the longest. And, you know, that's kind of one of the things that even as I got older in doing this, every year I was able to look at it and be like, well, this is going better than it was last year. Like there's no real discernible reason to quit. So, you know, that's what's kept me going up to this point is that, you know, it's been a slow grind, but it's been a very steady uphill grind. So, yeah, exactly. One thing I like about your come up, it is the most hip hop come up. You know what I'm saying? It is it is a hip hop come up because if there's if there's anything that that people in this culture and and people who participate in this culture can understand more than anything else. It's the whole, yo, I'm doing for self. With what little resources I've got and I'm going to and I'm going to go. Hip hop literally yeah. started stealing electricity out of an hour, <laughs> hour of the turntables yeah. to throw the, the the party in the rec room. Like exactly, you know. So I I appreciate that, and you know that is kind of the thing. It's like I I just exist on my own little island, 
you know, and, and, and that's one of the cool things. When I first got into the music business, there was this big wall of us versus them. There were the people that were signed within the major yep. label system. And then everybody else was like an aspiring kind of, you know, indie artist, you know, and now exactly that all that's basically been destroyed. Yep. The music business, everybody just kind of has their own lemonade stand now. Mm -hmm. And there is no us versus them. It's just how well do you run your own lemonade stand and yep. how successful is your lemonade? So for lack of a better term, but now, now, this guy is, is humble as fuck, okay? Because one thing that 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 you haven't mentioned, and and of course, what what you know, you're not that that type of person. But I'm gonna I'm gonna do it for you. Is there's no way in hell you'd still be doing what you're doing if you didn't have it. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. I um, you know what it is. It's there's just an earnest desire to keep getting better. You know, I was having a conversation earlier today. I, I, I had a mix session earlier in the studio today, and we were talking about people in the music business, even the ones who do it full time for a career. If it were about the money, like they would have quit a long time ago. <laughs> yep. You pay bills off this, like the music industry has the worst pay structure known mm. to man. Um, you know, and, and so saying that to say that, like, even the people that treat it as a business, we are powered by this desire to contribute to the pot and to try to, you know, knowing the acceptable standard of what is hip hop and, you know, fighting that battle with the person in the mirror to try to be better than you were last year and to try to top yourself and to, you know, continuously try to keep improving. Um, you know, it's, I, I don't know exactly what the it is. Like, I, I don't quite know how to put my finger on it. Like it's, it's something I can't turn off. Like, you know, I've never stepped away from this for very long, not longer than seven days to take a vacation or at a holiday or something like that. You know? Yeah. You're always hustling. If, if I was away from it, even, even outside of the business, like I can't go more than four or five days without like thinking of bars in my head or, you know, yeah. I, I want to sample this song and make a beat out of it or, yeah. you know, things of that nature. Like it, it, you know, I, I will say that in recent years, I've really gotten back to having a lot of fun doing this. This is hey. really because there was a period of time where making music felt a little bit like a chore or like a job or something that I kind of had to do. Yeah. And now it's more like I, I'm back to like I get to do this, you know, you know, doing the stuff really is my happy place. And so that's what makes all the headaches more digestible of like, yeah, you know, I end up with problems that I never would have had if I was working for somebody else. But, yeah. you know, when I wake up each day and, and, and for the most part, enjoy my reality, like that, that takes the edge off. Dog, those are good problems to have. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm real. cognizant of that. They're good problems to have. Uh, one thing, one thing about you too, that we've definitely got to mention before we get into the violence of healing is that, I think it's safe to say that you, Jake, are a, a tour de force because you are an MC, but you are so much more than an MC. You do so much more than just rock the mic. Yeah, I mean, you know, some people, it's it's kind of weird because different people know me for different things. Some people yeah. do know me for the music and the rapping. Some people know me for my production because, yep. you know, I do a lot of collab albums where it's me yep. on the beat and then somebody else on the mic. Like yep. me and El Sensei did Solving Cases, me and Rusty Jooks did Jake and the Jooks Man, me and Alexa Hexmaster did Fire and Lead, me and Q Unique did Royal Blood. So some people know me that way. There's people who don't know me for my music at all. They know me for my day job as an engineer. They know I'm the studio engineer and the guy you know, on the mix. And then there's people that just know me as the guy that talks on the internet. Cause <laughs> I do a lot of instructional videos, you know, to try and they're nothing fancy. It's just me in my living room or in the yeah. car or something, you know, but there's, 
it's so easy for artists to get frustrated and discouraged when they keep repeatedly trying to ram themselves into the front door and, and it's not opening. And I'm there to kind of tell people, hey, there's a side door open over here that you can just walk right into. Yeah. So to speak, in, in terms of trying to demystify a lot of the things about the music business and the pursuit of doing this DIY yourself. So yeah. there's people that just know me for my Instagram videos and don't follow <laughs> me at all. So regardless of, of what form it comes in, I, I, I just glad somebody's tuning in. You're right. Hell I, yes. I could be talking to a wall, but somebody's listening. I appreciate it. As long as people looking out for you, that that's really all that matters. Yeah. Now, The Violence of Healing, man. Woo. Very interesting record. Thank you. That's uh, one way to put it. <laughs> I mean, other than the fact that it's a damn good record, a very interesting record. You really open up a lot on this record. Um, I'm not going to say it was an emo record or anything like that, but you know, you, as an artist, it is it is your right to to express yourself and how you feel in whatever way you feel is going to work. And you do you do share a lot on this record. Do you ever, you know, ask yourself if you're letting out too much of yourself? Oh, I had a giant moral dilemma before I even <laughs> released this. I mean, yeah. as I was making it, not so much. And that's what very briefly, uh, you know, before we went live, we were talking about like this, this album is now a product on a shelf. Yep. And for the longest time, it was just a piece of art in my headphones. And it was just between me, my headphones and God, if he's listening. Right. And so... Saying that to say that when the album was finished and it was time to put it out, I had numerous big moral dilemmas, panic attacks, whatever you want to call them. When I was mastering it, after I had handed it in, you know, because you got to turn the album in about four weeks, you know, prior to release. So around the time right. I handed it in and then, you know, it goes live at midnight on technically Thursday night when the clock strikes Friday yep. that evening leading up to it, I had a knot in my stomach, not because I regretted anything. You know, I maintain if, if anybody can point out a lie I told on the record, I'll take. <laughs> um, but saying that to say, I was worried in some ways, like had I overshared? Um, Cause in some cases I probably did. I was, you know, these are real life things that really happened in exactly. real life involving exactly. real people that yep. in some cases still have real proximity to me. Yep. And, you know, even beyond that, some of those people have family members and loved ones that I have no ill will towards and don't want them to feel any collateral damage of something I might have said on a record. Of course. Um, but yeah, no, I definitely... As the weeks go by, and especially seeing the streams start to go up, um, you know, that feeling is lessened. Yeah. You know, and I've not, you know, nobody showed up on my doorstep to you know, <laughs> it, but shotgun uh, in hand. <laughs> saying that to say, like, uh, yeah, I had I had big reservations in the hours leading up to it and the weeks leading up to it. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think it's important that you put out the record, though, because if there's one thing about this record that I think is 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 a major high key point is that it's relatable as fuck. Thank you. Um, you know, it, the 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 album kind of skips around, sort of like a Tarantino movie, almost. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously, a large chunk of the record is about one specific situation, and you know, yeah. a, a particularly bad and messy breakup that I went through that had some long-term effects on me. But then, you know, there were other situations from years past that had just been kind of laying dormant that, you know, I felt were deserving of a song. Um, I truthfully did not get to everything. I, in all seriousness, to try to cover everything that I feel like I need to talk about that this one probably, record, nah. well, it would probably need to be a trilogy. Right, exactly. Um, and I do plan on, you know, revisiting it and doing a part two and three. I don't know when that will be. I 
for the moment would kind of like to focus on more positive, uh, you know, things in my future. But, but saying that to say, uh, I treated the record the way that I treat going to therapy. And what I mean by that is this, is I started going to therapy a year and four months ago. And Mm -hmm. I told my therapist from the first session that I'm going to keep it 10,000 with you because there is no point in doing any of this if I'm holding back or I'm not giving you my whole truth because you can't help me unless I'm giving you the complete unfiltered, uh, you know, what's really happening in my mind and my heart. Oh yeah. With that said, um, you know, this entire time I've been in therapy, uh, I've done just that. And I've said whatever I needed to say that was on my heart and mind, regardless of how unhinged it might have come across at the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having that space to just completely say everything with no filter you know, therapy has been more helpful than any medication ever has. I've had no luck in that department. But saying, you know, staying on topic, uh, I basically just treated the record that way. I treated it like it was one of my therapy sessions. Like I did not in the slightest think about like how this is going to be received. I know a lot of radio shows are not going to play these songs. Like you know, <laughs> mental meltdown is not going to fit in the middle of the mix. <laughs> In between the boom bap record about <laughs> the culture and then you know the song about the girls, like I get that. And and to be fair, a few DJs it's have all played, good though. A few DJs have played some stuff, and I really do appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate anybody that's willing to take a risk. But 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 saying that to say I, I made the record completely and totally for myself because I wrote it from the space of where I was at the absolute lowest, worst point of my life. Which was a very ironic time because this was simultaneously when my career was at its best and I was finally starting to get recognition for things that I had worked long and hard for. Yeah. So it was a very odd time in my life where professionally I it was all triumph and you know, personally behind the scenes, I was an absolute mess. And so Saying that to say that I treated the record like a therapy session. I'm like, you know, whatever I'm going to say, I'm just going to say it without regards of what the consequences are going to be for whomever of course. To hear it. Whether it's a person who actually knows what I'm talking about and forms an opinion about it, or whether it's just some fan who decides that I'm nuts. You know, <laughs> I, I did it just, uh, you know, for completely and totally for myself. Dog, you got to speak your truth. And, I, and I'm glad you made this record for yourself because that's exactly how it should be. Thank you, man. It's, uh, you know, it's it's weird because my, I, I guess it's not weird because this is what I always preach to artists about developing their community of fans that are going to rock with them regardless of, of who else rocks with you, you know. Yep. Compared to a lot of my other releases, especially Plant Based Libtard, the album yeah. before this, which was my yeah. most successful record to date. Um, you know, The Violence of Healing has not gotten that much coverage and it's not gotten, you know, like I was saying with the DJs, I get it. It doesn't always fit your format, but the audience has taken to it. And I think there you go. That, that, and you know, obviously that's all that matters. That's literally exactly. all that matters. Like what exactly. the industry thinks about it or what reviewers think about it or anything like that. None of that matters. What matters is what your audience, you know, how they relate to it. And I was a little nervous also because, you know, I always make, we, of course we've talked about this, the rap and wrestling connection. Uh, Yeah. The same way that the best wrestlers are playing a character that is an exaggerated version of their real self. Yeah. You know, Jake Palumbo is a cape that I put on that is an exaggerated character of my real self. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of Palumbo isms in my regular music. You know, I'm going to have Palumbo isms. I love that. I'm going to have the wrestling reference. I'm going to have the reference to girls. I'm going to have the reference to, you know, the government. I'm going to have all that stuff. And so I'm really just abandoning 
all this on that record. Like, yeah. lyrically, it's still, you know, it, there's still bars. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like, yeah. My, my flow. Oh, yeah. I don't think I sacrificed anything bar wise, but it was not, not about all. lyrical being lyrically dazzling. It was it was just right. about content and and getting what I had to say out. Uh, but saying that to say that, like, I wasn't wearing the Jake Palumbo cape quite as much on this record. Like this, I is, got that sense. Like this is, you know, this, like I said, this is like I put a hidden camera up in in one of my therapy sessions. Uh, this is this is your reality TV show live, my kind of behind the scenes reality TV yeah. show. Yeah, your um, confessional scenes, one long confessional. You know, and so I, uh, that's basically what I did because in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, again, going back to what's the worst that could happen. Yeah. You know, do I hold this stuff in for the other thing is I've been procrastinating on this for a while. Like if oh. if you go back to two albums prior to that, if you go back to the hundred thousand air hobo, which is okay. 2019. In the intro to that album, the little robot voice says Jake Palumbo's next album will be a exploration of his innermost feelings. And oh, personal OK, thought. OK. Because <laughs> even back then I was already going through stuff. You know, I had a minor yeah. stroke that year, like a bunch of stuff happened. My relationship yeah. was beginning to fall apart. So that was supposed to be the next album. But then the 2020 election season happened and then the world was on fire. And then George yeah. Floyd happened and Breonna Taylor yeah. happened. And then, yeah. you know, Kyle Rittenhouse happens. And so what happens is I end up spending most of my year arguing with you know, MAGA on the internet. Yep. <laughs> and getting all these death threats thrown in my yeah, inbox. And what the fuck? Tard. And Jeez. so that's what makes plant-based live tard is that I put my feelings on hold because I felt like I had to suit up and go to war. Yeah. So, when you drop, when you drop live tard, I was not surprised at all. Thank you, <laughs> so, you know, that got, that kind of got pushed to the back. You know, because I had to suit up and make that record, and I'm glad I did. Because, like I said, oh, yeah. to, to date, it's my most successful release, and I think record, if there's man. one, maybe, you know, up to this point, if there's one definitive Jake Palumbo record, it's probably that one. But as soon as that record came out, like that's when everything started, just completely. You know, as I say in the intro, like my mental health went completely into the toilet. Yeah, and you know, things just got so escalated that it was unavoidable like i had to find an outlet to get these things out and of course or i was heavily on my way to crashing and burning very quickly so mm -hmm. that started with going to therapy and by the time i get in and you know again as i'm in therapy like my career is active like i'm having to right. get fired lead done and shooting music videos and you know i'm for the internet, like I'm having to keep a happy face on and, you know, act exactly. as if nothing is wrong. Like for two whole yeah, years, man. basically. Yeah, man. So, you know, and, and because the other thing was, the, the one thing I will say I maybe did correctly during that time, or at least didn't allow my grief and abandonment to take from me, was that I wasn't going to let it mess up everything I worked for. Because it was in those years... 2021, 22, and 23, that like I felt like the world finally really started warming up to what I did. Mm -hmm. And I waited my whole life for this. And I, I went through hell to get here. And hell I yeah. wasn't going to let anything rob me of that. So that just meant Good I had to put on a face for the internet for two years. But yeah. eventually, you know, like I said, going to therapy and eventually making the music to get it all out. And you know, make this artistic statement that's going to outlive me. It'll be there long after I will. And, you know, that has really helped the process of being in a much better place today than I was. You know. I hear you completely. I hear you completely. I'm still nuts. I'm still bashing <laughs> crazy. And I have damn my well, days where Damn my, well better be. <laughs> I, I still have my days where my brain will just short circuit. But... Yeah. On a day to day basis, you know, things have drastically improved. And one of the things that, you know, we keep going back to, like, is music is therapy, is that having all this art 
and getting to share that with people and them loving it and them feeling like, you know, they can relate to it somehow too. And then I'm talking and, you know, you said something earlier about the emo. I have jokingly called this my emo album. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Before I had a title for the record, the Google drive folder with all the rough demos, it's just said emo album. <laughs> um, but you know, it's uh, like I said, you know, being able to just get it out and now it exists and it's a thing, and I don't have to really think about it anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, I still have to promote it. We've got three more music videos to shoot, and, you know, those dope, dope, still things we got to do. Uh, but it, it's a big weight off my shoulders, and I can. I can start focusing on things like the next Jake Palumbo album, which I'm already yeah. a couple songs into. And, you know, uh, like I said, the, the, the music has really come back to be in my happy place. Like I, I get greater enjoyment out of it currently than I probably ever have. The only time I was maybe this giddy was when I was like 21 and trash. You know, it just it was not good at making music yet, but your heart's so pure, you know, you, yeah. you, you feel like you're in Madison Square Garden. Um, that yeah, early, the early earnest yes. version of you. Yeah, yes. definitely. I feel like I'm I mean, back to that. That's dope, man. That's dope. Uh, lyrically, I, I've always appreciated your bars. I've always appreciated your flow. Uh, you have your own unique jake palumbo wisms if we're going to call him that but your production on this jeez dog what informed the production is because you cooked thank you man you, I, fucking, uh, you burn the kitchen down up in this motherfucker you know i always say like as a rapper you're either gonna love me or hate me like people you know, there's very little middle ground there but as a yeah. producer Oh. I feel like about everybody should be able to agree on the beats. Um, Hell yeah. Because, you know, I just have a very vast set of influences. Like, you know, I was I was obviously from the jump, I was inspired by the Bomb Squad and the RZA. Yeah. Almost as big an influence was DJ Paul and Juicy J from 3-6 Mafia. I think mm -hmm. they're the most creative producers that ever came out of the South. Mm -hmm. Um, I was big into Pete Rock. I was into Dilla, Muggs, Mad Lib, the Beat Miners. And you can tell. You can tell. You know. Um, but saying that to say that, like, I, I think it was a blessing, kind of being from the South, of because it took so long for the South to really build up what they had. We listened yeah. to stuff from everywhere. Like, yeah. I probably listened to more Southern rap living in New York than I did <laughs> when I was in Tennessee. I was listening to Wu Tang and Public Enemy and Boot Camp Click, and you know. And then you um, move up north, and it's all south. Now I'm listening to <laughs> UTK and Master P, right? So uh, that's just me. I'm always a weirdo in my environment, but it's all uh, crazy. But yeah, like I uh, I appreciate that. I. I to me, the music is the universal thing that lures people in. Like people, yeah. people like us and, you know, the people that watch your show and, you know, they listen to lyrics and they pay attention to, to what people are saying and they care about content and stuff like that. For most people, like the average person who in exactly reality is who we're really trying to reach. Yep. They have to be lured in by the music. Yep. You know, they're and then hopefully they'll absorb the lyrics while they're there, yep. you know. Yeah. Um, so I, and the other thing too, is I realized like for the things that I'm talking about on this record, the soundtrack has got to be pleasing to the ear uh, or you're yeah. probably not gonna <laughs> you got around a little bit that. of balance there. <laughs> you know, it, it's got to be. So I, I did put a, maybe a little bit of extra effort into that. And, but at the same time, like when I pick beats, you know, I make more beats than I can ever rap on, you know, I believe it. Uh, oh, which is good because I that I can team up with other rappers and make projects yeah. together. And yeah. then those just, hey, pick 10 beats you like out of the pile and we'll make an album. But when I pick beats for myself, I basically just pick what I gravitate towards. Um, You know, and sometimes that's what other people might pick and sometimes it's not. But I maybe was a little more conscious on this one of like, given that the content was so dark and so personal and it, with the exception of the single, your boyfriend has a mustache. Like there's not a lot of upbeat songs yeah. on the record. 
So I'm like, if I'm if I'm taking you through this dark abyss for 33 minutes, a <laughs> dark abyss. Damn. You know, the the, the, the soundtrack <laughs> has got to be pleasing to the ear. Like those yeah. beats have got to you know lure you in. To, so hopefully, then you'll listen to what I'm saying. Definitely. And the one thing about this record too is, let's use the example of the production. The production, if you're you know not uh, as you mentioned a little more invested in in the music in hip-hop in general the music's what's going to draw you in but what's going to happen and i'm sure it's already happened with with folks who dig jake palumbo is you're gonna you're gonna be drawn in by by the beats and the production and then you're gonna hear the lyrics find something yourself can relate to and then they're gonna dig for some more shit and then realize that jake palumbo is actually an entire 64 you know crayon box of colors there's a lot of layers. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot I'm of layers. Saying. Um, that's what I tried to do. Like I've always, that's why I've always added humor into what I do because I feel like if you can make people laugh, yeah, you've got a better chance of them listening to your actual knowledge and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, but I just. <sighs> I don't know. It, it just comes out of my brain from my brain to the pen. Like I'm, I'm generally writing for an audience of one. Like I'm, <laughs> that's perfect. All those punchlines are strictly to make myself laugh. I appreciate it when other people do. Um, and, and I do have like a small network of maybe like 25 people who, you know, who's, who's I can say, I honestly care about their opinion, but you know, when I'm writing, generally, I'm writing for an audience of one. But but the cool thing about, and I don't think I was able to capture this quite as much on my first couple albums, is that with time and repetition and becoming, you know, a veteran at your craft, you figure out how to say more with less. Then you, you know, a lot of the greatest MCs, I use Sean Price as one of these examples mm. because he was my favorite rapper of the modern era, but when you look at power, like his earliest first. stuff, you know, he was, he just used a lot more words. Like he yeah. was packing yeah. a lot more lyrics into each yeah. hour. And then as he kept getting older and, and if, you know, he'd lived, I think he would have continued to get better at this. His actual rhyme structure was much simpler, but he was yep. saying a double and triple entendre within yeah. that simple line. Yeah. And so saying that to say, I've tried over the years to be able to say more with less, to, to try to make it more relatable to people. Because in the early days, you know, people would have jokes about, well, you need a thesaurus to listen to his music yeah. and yeah. You know, stuff like that. So I can never fully abandon my wordy brainiac weirdness because I think that's what people who do like my music like about me. Yeah, but. Definitely. Again, with time and experience, you kind of learn how to convey more without just so many words. Like, you know, you're able to say a little bit more with a little bit less. And sometimes, you know, a, a simpler punchline can be deeper. Yeah. You know, so. I'm curious. What do you think Black Elvis would say about this record? I'd be honored. Uh, about the violence of <laughs> healing, I have no idea. I don't know. I, I really have no idea. Um. Cool Keith is one of my biggest influences. I uh, I did produce a record that he was on. Uh, it was called Killa. It was Rock Mecca featuring Cool Keith, Vast Air, and Mock Hami. It came out in 2018. So I did. Cool Keith did rhyme over a Jake Palumbo beat. I would love to actually get a song with him in rhyming before it's all said and done. Um, that's one of my big influences. Let's not sleep on what you just said. Let's break this down. The names that you just listed that are all on one record that you produced. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's not let's not shortchange the situation here. Yeah, Again, uh, Jake being humble as fuck. <laughs> so, yeah, so I produced Rock Mecca released an album in 2018 called Iron World that I produced the whole thing. And one of the singles was a song called Killer. And the three features on it were Cool Keith, Vast Air, and Makami. Look at that. How many um, people, how many people can say, oh, yeah, yeah we did a record together <laughs> with, with all those people. How many know, people can say that? 
Sometimes Come I on. think this is why I need a manager. Like I need a Jimmy Hart with a megaphone following me around because <laughs> you know, you know what it is. It's not even that I'm trying to forget these things. It's that just like my mind is so focused on the work and what I need to be doing now, and you know that I sometimes forget like a lot of the catalog that has been built up over the years to the point where when people ask me what I who I've worked with, it's it's so many names that like I'll draw a blank trying to think of it. Um, you know, but no, nah, that's uh, it's been an honor. I mean, it, it's it's an honor also to being able to be friends with so many MCs that you know I grew up thinking we're great and you yep. know them dropping by the space lab to come kick it and you know it, it uh you know it, that's one thing it's never lost on me like i i and that's why i get so agitated at people who complain because like oh you know a lot of us like actively really want to be here and are glad to be here yeah. and, and are appreciative yeah. like i said I, I don't look at it like i have to do this i look like it like i get to do this exactly so yeah that, that's that's not lost on me there you go there you go well yo man it, it it's you know it's always it's always a pleasure having you not bro just likewise, man. likewise but just chatting we, we 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 haven't had a chance to catch up too much since the last time we talked but i mean we have opportunities like this to to be able to do it but and i want to i want to let you know you know jimmy hart may not be in your corner right now but anytime we have an opportunity to do it. We will be the mouth of south for you, man. Word, man. I we will shout your praise. We will shout your praises, dog. I appreciate that, man. Okay? Y'all have definitely supported ever since we linked up, man. Whenever oh, I can yeah. get up to Canada, man, I gotta come rock with y'all, man, for sure. For real, nah. I I I really appreciate you coming back into the lounge space. Obviously, I appreciate you as a homie and as an artist and and. I just want to help spread the word, let people know that Jake Palumbo is no joke. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. The Violence of Healing. Up, yeah, definitely. The Violence of Healing is available right now. You've already mentioned you, you've got three more singles still coming out, right? Yeah, we just dropped a music video for Lost My Minds. Uh, okay. There's a music video for Your Boyfriend Has a Mustache. It's yeah. half done. Um, I've... I've had a few technical difficulties, mainly because I'm not a filmmaker. I, I aimed a little higher on this video, and I've, uh, that one's cute. still almost, that one's in process. It'll be out soon. But we're going to do videos for two more songs, probably Remember Me for Me and maybe Ice. Oh, okay, there we go. There we go. We're do videos for those. Uh, in the meantime, I'm always doing stuff as a producer. Uh, me and M. Ski have an album coming out called The Slow Burn. Uh, yep. The first single just came out called Ship Them Out. Me and Westside Ward got a 10 song album called Dying in Designer. Uh, yep. Out now, uh, me and Q Unique, Royal Blood, uh, me and Lexa Hexmaster, Fire and Lead. Listen to this guy. <laughs> so, yeah, man. Uh, he's just that guy. <laughs> I just, it's, it's about the work, man. Like, I, I want to leave behind the big catalog because I always looked Proper. up to artists like Prince and Frank Zappa and people hey. that like people that left with a big catalog, you know, and that's what I want to Proper. that's what I want to try to do while I'm here, man. I'm glad that Remember Me for Me is gonna be an upcoming single because that's definitely one of one of my highlights on the record. You fucking killed that joint, okay? Thank you, man. That's we that's why we had to end the album with that. I felt like it was a, a good clincher statement. Definitely. So, definitely yeah it will be a video for that one for sure you gotta let people know how they can cop the record man uh it's available at spacelabrecordings.bandcamp.com uh it's available on all streaming platforms spotify apple music amazon everywhere probably will be a cd release uh usually at space hey. lab will drop digitally and then we'll do cds you know a couple months later um but yeah it's available everywhere and while you're there there's a big catalog of a bunch of other stuff. Exactly. Um, the violence of healing is a interesting place to start. Um, if you <laughs> right, uh, it's kind of like meeting somebody on the worst day of their life. But uh, <laughs> but saying that to say that uh, you know there, there, there's a vast catalog of a whole bunch of other music. 
the is what I'm is what I'm saying. Put it this way: the violence of healing is this different shade of blue in the crayon box that you may not have. You know what I mean? You may not have like encountered it before, but then what's going to happen once you start coloring with that particular crayon, it's going to make you look for what else is going on in that Crayola box. And that's going to find your discography and people are going to really get into what Jake yes, Plummer is all about. There you go. Love it. Dog, appreciate you. Jay, Thanks thank for spending you for time with us. Always oh, man. Always a pleasure. You... I'll come back anytime, man. Anything y'all need. Hell yeah. You know we always got time for you, dog. Yes, sir, man. Appreciate you having me, yo. Peace. Respect. Peace. Sir.